Conference, your source for JVM knowledge. So first, uh, some words about my company. I work for Rewe Digital, you probably don't know it, it's a German company. Uh, second largest food retailer in Germany is Rewe, and we are the digital division. So our job is basically to put a classic food retailer online, digital, whatsoever. And uh, one of our biggest products is the um, delivery service. So you can order online and we'll deliver it to you whenever you like to have it. Uh, we also have some pickup service. We, we do warehouse automation right now, so um, something like Amazon for food. Okay, Amazon is doing that as well now, but we are bigger in Germany. Um, we have also a big data division and some research and innovation stuff like robots and stuff. Uh, we are using a bunch of technologies. <coughs> I hope you don't notice there's no G technology up here, but actually our teams are using uh, Spock. Almost 80% of our teams are using Spock for testing. Well, there's no Spock logo, so... Yeah, right. So that was, ba that was definitely a reason I didn't put it here, even though I... Uh, use a little rocket like everybody does. Um, we have about 40 teams and we're working Agile, Kanban, Scrum, whatever you like. So t it's up to the teams how they work. <coughs> so what was the challenge we were facing? So recently we started using microservices like three years ago and we started out with a monolith actually based on struts. Uh, so uh, Good that nightmare ends right now. But now we have like 150 services making up that shop product of ours. We have um, self written um, <coughs> Node.js uh, fr front end composition. So every single microservice can deliver their own micro front ends and we just composite it into a website. And we have about 25 teams working on that. And this is how they deploy. <laughs> and um, so we don't have any strict rules on when you can deploy on production and when you can't. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Um, so the idea behind that is every team should be responsible and accountable for what they do. And so we don't lay any rocks in their way. If they have a service which is just in the back and producing some Kafka messages, and if that service dies for a week, nobody will notice, fine, go ahead, go to production. If you do something like the start page or some service that's critical for placing orders, please don't. But it's up to you. I mean, if you have a really good test suite, go ahead, deploy to production. Do it within 10 minutes. And this is where I come into play. I'm a quality engineer. I help them to actually do that because that's our goal. We want to have teams being able to get to production in a matter of minutes. So, and this is our vision for, for QA. Basically, every single commit on master would go into some tests, like unit tests, integration tests, whatsoever, like mocking something or not mocking something, as you like. Then we build the service. Then we um, do some uh, black box service testing or something in between, maybe some contract testing. Then we just throw it to uh, an integration system. And so this is the tricky part here. We, we want to do some fully integrated testing there as well, at least for the critical services. Yeah, and then we just throw it to production. I mean, it's Friday afternoon. Everybody wants to go home, so why not? Nah, probably not. And um, just in case, we are getting pretty good at monitoring using Prometheus and stuff like that. So if you'd like to talk about that, afterwards. <laughs> so um, our test pyramid is basically made up of a solid basis of unit tests. Um, then we have the second story. We say service tests where we need to have a ready service, at least a jar or something like that, or a Docker container. And then the top is kind of, there's a gap in between because now we need a test system and we need 
for some services, especially if you're maintaining the third page of the checkout, you need to do a lot of ramp up to, to get you there on a fully integrated test. And uh, many teams didn't just do it, and that caused a lot of uh, outages and mistakes and bug reports back then. So uh, our first approach actually was, yeah, let team like throw their services, they throw their tests into one comprehensive um, test suite for the whole shop. And that would run out of the, peop uh, out of the team's um, interest, so at some general CI system that kind of a leftover when you uh, turn a monolith into a, a microservice system. And uh, the test suite grew bigger and bigger and runs longer and longer and we ended up with a three hour test run. And of course it was red because it always, one or two tests were always red. So um, no fun here. And um, also, nobody was actually responsible for maintaining a test suite. So most teams just threw in their tests. Then there were some people like me, and we were trying to keep it alive, but it's getting harder. And we and the code of the teams, I mean, show a Java developer Ruby, and he can do some amazing stuff, but he can also do some really terrible stuff. And stumbled above on classes only consisting of closures. I think he did ev didn't even know that he could do methods. <laughs> so, <coughs> we, we wanted to make system tests easy, fully integrated system tests easy for the team. So, <coughs> we, we started to build up a, a tool case for them. And we wanted to put in some... Um, uh, some uh, base test class to basically set up everything nicely. So we extended JEP spec and have now our Raver shop spec. Then we um, put in some test environment configuration, like nobody needs to know where the test system is. You can just say configure test system URL. They don't need to know that. Um, then we uh, put in some JEP configuration. So uh, recently, I turned it from uh, pure Docker to uh, test containers. Thank you for that. And um, yeah, so now uh, every team can just uh, gradle test minus p test browser, and then uh, it, it will fire up a uh, test container, Chrome or Firefox or whatever. Page objects for every single page on the on the shop that's relevant for the test. Uh, some further code for navigating through it, like doing some macro navigation things. Uh, some hacks, actually, because it, the, that whole ramp up, like registering a user every single time, it just takes a lot of time to click through that dialogues and stuff. And then some test fixtures, so basically products that should be available. Mar in our shop, it's kind of special. You have to select the market, like put in your zip code, and then you can select the market you, you will be delivered from, and stuff like that. So the resulting tests will look somewhat like this. So we have some strange things here. First of all, this. We call it the test actor. It's basically an object representing a user. And I'll go into that uh, a little later. Then we have the config I promised, like where is which service, where's the starting page, where's whatever. Um, something like this. this, these are our test fixtures. You need an address which is actually matching the market, so um, no, no need to type in the, the street name and the zip code every time. And these are the, um, yes, kind of setup methods. We always prefix them with, with. Uh, which indicates this method is using every dirty trick it can. <laughs> That's the idea. I mean, it's a builder pattern, you, you can see. And, um, and also, it will always return this. Um, so the idea is basically, for example, add that's default. For example, we have that nasty um, <coughs> thing like cookie consent pop up in the bottom of the page. Yeah, we're all Europeans, we know that. Ah, uh, you're not. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and, and basically we just set a cookie 
and then it's done. And there are some other things like selecting the market. So the market chooser is like four clicks. I mean, that's ridiculous UX, but yeah, it's there. And so we, you, but you can also just set the zip code and the market ID in a cookie and you're done. So we do things like that just to be fast. Also, um, with register, just talks directly to the services required. Um, so to the user, uh, to the customer data service, and to the auth service to get a ticket and stuff like that. Yeah, and then some, some jab magic behind this to set the window size. Yeah, then we uh, rely heavily on Jeb's awesome page objects, of course. Um, so when we want to do some more detailed uh, interaction with one or two pages, we just grab the page object and uh, take that. And then we have uh, verification sometimes done via a service. So we don't need to navigate to some page to, for example, here. We could also navigate to the basket page and just check if the next button is enabled. That would be the UI way, but actually, at some point, you just want to know, can I go to checkout right now? I don't want to go there, you know. I just want to know, has that worked? Or did that product actually made it to the basket? And we're just relying on the API there. So it's the same API the mobile applications use, so um, it's actually a good test as well. So um, this is uh, a test actor. <laughs> Just to elaborate the concept. Um, so we are using uh, basically a class. So we, we're doing that object-oriented thing here. Um, <coughs> and uh, a normal user has some kind of device, a phone or a computer. And so we just give the browser to that class, which is basically representing that device, right? Um, a user has some kind of knowledge about himself, like an identity an address where he lives, um, some preferences. For example, he has a credit card and not a PayPal account or something like that. And we, we have a lot of defaults for this. So basically, if you say new uh, shop user actor, it has everything he needs to, to, uh, to go through the checkout. But you can always use the with method to, to use something different than the default. So um, we basically represent this with uh, some fields, plain stupid fields. And then the user has some idea how the application works. And um, this is represented just with some classes, really high level classes like add a product to the basket or a log in or register. Register is actually a long, uh, long running thing. And uh, then we have our hacks, like with locked in, with basket ready for checkout is really nasty because we're using the search and yeah. Um, and uh, we also have the service clients to directly interact with the service. So, and, and here are three little dots. Um, there's one issue with that idea, and I, I did that on several products now. And there's one issue, um, you're creating him. Who's recognizing this? <laughs> ah, okay, it's not too bad. Yeah. It's a fresco from uh, the sixth, uh, from from the chapel in Rome. So this is God and this is Adam, and we don't want God here. We don't want you don't want God as a class, right? So um, so then Jab 2.5 came out, and I finally could do something awesome. Where I, I was just removing a lot of stuff into traits and then made the base class just implement all those traits. It's actually still a God pattern, of course, but um, the code is at least separate. So, uh, and, and I can just make the team, yeah, could you take care? You know you're doing the login service. Could you please take care of the login trait for once in a while? And so that's quite nice. Um, so we, we created something like the register trait, the uh, login trait, checkout trait is pretty big, and uh, the basket trait, and now this is pretty nice. So we just keep some basic knowledge in here and uh, the, the basic tooling like the browser or REST client or something like that. And then who is familiar with the concept of, who's not familiar with the concept of page objects here? 
Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll go over it quick. So the basic idea of a page object is also like representing pa um, parts of your page as, as a class. And um, so you could have a login page, and it has an URL, uh, and it has, for example, a register link that might be here, and a password recovery link, and a uh, login form, which can in JAP be an awesome module, which you can reuse across uh, your whole application. So on, a, on another page, there might be exact the same form, and I can just say, OK, it's a login form. And uh, it can have some inputs I can interact with, and a submit button. So, th and that's what we're using all the time. Like when you rem remember the test I showed you, I, I just went to the shop page and did some things with some abstract things like the login form. And then there's the rest of the page, and I don't care about the rest of the page, so it does, it's not here. And then I also can, can add methods to the pages, like I don't care that I had to fill out these two things and then press the button. I just say login, and it does exactly that. So it's like every other page, I can, I can put in additional methods. So now we, we have uh, some, some real nice uh, abstraction levels. On the first level, we have the test. And the test is actually um, in, the, in the language of the use case. So when I show this test to an average PO product owner, he will at least get the idea what this test is actually doing. And if I combine that with something like unroll, he will still get what I'm doing. And so uh, thanks to Spock, this is actually extremely readable. When we discussed how we do UI testing four years ago, <clears throat> we also thought about Cucumber. And we were close to choosing that. And then I showed uh, my colleagues a test like this, and suddenly the whole idea of writing text files became stupid. Because if, if you have code that a PO can read and understand, and even change, I, I have a PO who changes those test cases, um, there's no point in, in putting that extra abstraction in Cucumber and right? Then we have the test actor, and he's basically written in the language of the workflow. So there is a login. So I suppose there's something like login, the concept of in, in the workflow of logging in. Then there might be some concept like checking out, which might be involving translating over 10 pages, and so on. And also, um, yeah, what, what you need, like, um, PayPal account and stuff like that. And then we have the page objects, and they are basically only describing the page structure. So we try to keep it clean of uh, two sophisticated methods, because we have the test actor where that can take place. But if there is something like, for example, an address page I'll show you in a bit, um, that's quite complex, a lot of text fields, and we just put in an object an address uh, fixture, basically, and it fills out that thing in, in just one line. Okay. Now, um, yeah, first, I'd like to do a little demo. So this is quite like the test I showed you before. So we have uh, an actor, and we just put in those uh, width uh, manipulators. We have an uh, ad address which is working. We set the resolution. Then we go to our shop page and search for milk, which is, which is uh, milk in German. And so now, should probably change to cloning the screen. Yeah, so that was a cookie hack to, to just uh, get away from selecting the market. Also, that dialog disappears due to a cookie hack. And the test is done. So we didn't see that much, but <laughs> it works like that. And uh, we also have another test. And this is more like uh, why, we, why the hell are we doing this? And uh, the, the idea here is uh, you, you can select when the driver will arrive at your home and deliver your food. 
uh, which is quite important because we're delivering something like uh, deep, um, like uh, frozen pizza on ice cream, and it turns out it melts. And um, so, so we really want to make sure the customer is actually available. Yeah, you should have selected debug, right? Um, so we say, a user, please have a basket ready for checkout. And then just go to a page where, where we can see the time slots he can select. No, don't fail me now. Don't fail me now. <laughs> Damn it. Okay. Yeah, okay. So now um, we say, please go to the checkout step. And this is quite a lot of work to do. Uh, yeah, I do. Sorry, I should not show you that. <laughs> so it's basically a while loop. Um, and, and then I have process methods for every single page, and it's actually pretty nasty. But um, our check, ah, damn it. <laughs> so, but our checkout is really like um, there's that address page, and you have to do something completely different than on the other page. So, no. Oh, come on. Yeah. And now, I'll put that away. I haven't that, uh, tried it with two screens, actually. So now he's, now we are at the right page, and you can see my cursor. Anybody seen my cursor? I miss him. Um, and you can see here a lot is uh, not available. And so we have to, to go through the whole page to, to find those. And now we could actually select one. And uh, this is all automated now. So uh, we, we cycle through the, um, through the different pages and um, yeah, to, to find that. <coughs> and then we count them, and uh, as you could see, if I find my cursor again, it wants to verify that there are at least 20 slots available. And there are not, probably. Yeah. Can't see anything from there. Yeah, it, it will throw an exception. I pressed the wrong button. Sorry. Just go on. <laughs> yeah. And it will <laughs> fail because uh, there are too little. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm completely lost in my demo. Sorry. Um, so let's go back to the presentation. <coughs> I can't. No. no. Okay. Um, so are we, are we happy with this solution? Um, the basic idea is actually um, every team can use this and every team can execute it, uh, write a test and execute it in their own CI. So whenever I deploy the time slot service, for example, I can execute that test I just tried to demo. And, um, <coughs> and um, if my service was broken, this test will break. It will also break a lot of other tests in, on other teams, but it will tell me quite specifically what went wrong. We added a lot of um, thought into the reporting, so actually when it, your test fails, it will tell you in the logs where it fails and what the <coughs> test actor was just trying to do. So on every single occurrence of an error, I can see, oh, it failed at the time slot page, so i probably go over to that team and try ask them what the hell is going on. Or it failed on the, at the address page, and I can go to that team again and, and ask them what's going on. So, um, but the point is I can, I can have just this minimal test suite for myself, for my own service. And I can care about all the little details I care about. Like on those time slots, there needs to be the um, correct delivery uh, fee and there needs to be the correct time, and it needs to be formatted in a certain way, and there should something being shown when I select the time slot, and so on. And this I can all test for myself, but most other teams won't care. They 
they don't care what's on that page, right? So um, instead of, of having that comprehensive test suite, we now have one test suite which runs like two minutes at most. And it will only tell us, yeah, your checkout is still working. And we run it like every 30 minutes on, on all our test environments. So we have like a early alarm. So if any team is doing some stupid things or maybe even the platform is misbehaving, we had some issues with firewall rules. Probably we were the only ones who ever had that. And, um, and our um, external services not responding and something like that. So something out of our reach. Then we'll uh, have a failing test and then we can investigate, but only if that really is the case. <coughs> And all other teams can, can write some detailed tests about the features of their service, execute it in their own CI, and they will notice early if, if one of those breaks. So are we happy now? Um, well, we, we made it this far. Now we have to make the teams actually use it. So some teams still think, yeah, that Selenium is just nasty, and I probably don't need it. So whenever an incident happens, I um, keep going to the team and asking, would it help? Probably would. And so there are more and more joining this. Um, <coughs> um, right. Uh, and, and we have that feature that they are executed in the CI cycles of the teams. We also have um, quite readable UI tests, which is a huge asset. Um, so it's actually great to have these abstraction layers. There's not many cases in which we would have to change all three layers. Most of the time we are only changing the page objects because some UX wisdom made a login dialog a three-click dialog or something like that. Uh, we very rarely change the test actor at all. Most of the time, we are just adding new functionality to make it even more comfortable. And we almost never change any test case because login stays login, going through the checkout stays the checkout. I mean, if, if you don't care about the details about the checkout, you just use the checkout method, which will, which will take you right to the end. So for example, we also have an, a feature uh, order modification, but I need an order that I can modify, right? And we did not make it to directly fake an order. It's just too complicated due to the backend systems. So we just place that order. It takes about 20 seconds, which is nasty. But still, we can then just check it. And in the test itself, it just says, yeah, I have an order. That's it. Um, yeah, right. That's a new method I, I just added last week with completed order. and it, returns basically the order object, and I can then visit the detail page and stuff like that. So it's actually nice for the tests to stay readable and just focus on what I actually want to do. Um, we have that minimized uh, common test suite that I was talking about, which is giving us an extra level of security for the whole product. And uh, the downsides are kind of like uh, the teams still need to take care of this. So we are still in that position where nobody's actually responsible for, for that uh, test library. So now it's not an annoying test suite, but an annoying library. So um, what we are currently trying is to uh, create a team, a cross-team team, a meta team, to, to take care of that and uh, to, to basically encourage the teams to do pull requests on the library. So whenever you change a page in, in the product, you just uh, do a pull request on that page object, and it's updated, and the teams know, ah, I'm responsible for the address page, for example, or for the time slot page. And so if I change it, I go to the library and change it. It would be better if every team is using it. They will notice on their own CI, CD then. Um, one huge thing, at least for us, is handling of test data. So on one test system, we are still relying on test data, which originates in 2014, I think. And it kind of derodes in, in many cases. And it's no way close to what we have in production. So uh, this is the next challenge we have to face to have some 
sync with production. And um, keeping the code base small, like really having a pull request system where we can just reject two complicated things is really key here. So we, we just uh, changed it so nobody can actually push to master or something. And they need to uh, do a pull request because it started to derode again into really complicated methods. And we said, yeah, that's not the concept of the test actor. It should not be a magic box. It should just keep things simple. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Please leave me feedback at uh, that QR code. And uh, if you have any questions, we um, still have plenty of time. So it sounds like all of your teams, as you said, have their own smaller test suites that, yeah. that can run, right? So in your test act, your, your shop actor and all that is in a library, is that? Yeah. And I, I've used Jeb, but it's been years. How do, how do they all? You just declare it as a dependency in your team's yep. tests, and they and they they just get that all automatically. Yeah, that's basically it. So it's a uh, it's a, a Groovy library uh, I built with Maven, and I just put it in our internal artifactory, and everybody can just declare the dependency, and then they can um, just trying to get here again. Um, so you basically extend a, a Ravel shop spec. And um, yeah, you, you have that test user available. So how do you uh, like enforce that people are using the latest library? Uh, most of the teams are actually declaring like latest. Um, and just be, because it should be, there, there's no point. It's, it's like having a Selenium dependency and having an automated updated browser. There is no point in using a, uh, an older version than the latest one because uh, the surroundings won't stop changing. And the same uh, applies for this. If, if you, um, so if we deploy a version 250 of a service and it changes its, its page, it, there is no point in, um, in, in leaving the service with the old knowledge about that page. right? So most teams actually have something like a, um, you, you can do a a range, a version range in Maven, and they just say, okay, give me anything that's uh, at least in the zero point uh, or in the 1.0 uh, um, release cycle. So we do some sample there. Any more, Any more questions? questions? <coughs> um, yeah, how, how do you te uh, handle test pollution? <coughs> like What, what's test pollution? What? And um, so I'm, I'm speaking ah, here. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, I saw the hand up there and I was All confused. Right. I don't see the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, like, like I mean, uh, you are recreating new users, like because after you yeah. put something in the basket, you've polluted the state of this yeah. user. Yeah, we have some. Um, th it, that's actually one additional challenge we currently face. So we're creating orders and orders and orders, and you saw those time slots. They have limited capacity. So we uh, reset uh, their capacity all the time right now. Um, but we're working on a cleanup job, basically. So every um, test user, uh, um, the, the, the email address is the same pattern for every single user. And um, we're working on some cleanup scripts to run um, on a separate Jenkins, like every 30 minutes or two times a day, we, we have to figure and basically uh, deletes everything that's at least one, uh, 30 minutes old. So we don't interrupt uh, or, or we don't disturb running tests, but we get rid of the, all the orders that we created. And that's uh, the biggest problem. Creating like, uh, probably we have like 3 million users right now created by this, but we actually don't care because on the test systems, that's fine. We, we have that amount of users in production as well. So we actually add some more value to our test suites because otherwise you have that, uh, what Jacob just showed, like the, the water tap and you just turn it up and like in production. Uh, so having one registered, one, one user in, in 
half an hour, that's totally fine. Our system should be capable of taking that anyway. So, yeah. The main problem is the uh, orders that are created. There's one question up there. <coughs> Hi. Um, I was wondering, um, do you test against uh, several browsers? Um, I mean, um, Chrome, Firefox, and uh, mobile also? Yeah, we are testing. Right now, we are concentrating on desktop and not the mobile breakpoints. But um, you see here with Windows size, we are also working on with breakpoint. And it then just goes to an enum, like uh, give me the mobile breakpoint for iPhone 4 or something like that. And uh, so we plan to, to test the mobile website. And we also plan on some Appium in here. So you could basically use the same concept of the test actor, but just take an Appium um, automation instead of Selenium. So uh, we plan on that, but it's not done yet. Um, we also test with Firefox and Chrome currently. And we want to acquire some magic box from uh, a company in Switzerland so we could actually do some testing on that nasty Internet Explorer 11, which is still used by people. If you, if you are one of those, please stop. <laughs> but it's like 10% of our revenue, actually. It's terrible. OK, thank you. Any more questions? I think we have time for one more. No? Cool. OK, thank you. Thank you.